TV, a high-speed chase, uh, fighting the bad guys, and uh, uh, getting shot at, and uh, TV scenario. You know, real life sometimes is a lot different than what you see on TV. Uh, not long ago, I saw a clip on, uh, it, was, it was a news clip, it was live footage of, of a policeman in a high-speed chase. That they caught the bad guy out on the interstate, they were running you know, over 100 miles an hour. They caught the bad guy, and there was a shootout that ensued, and, and the policeman got shot, like, in the leg. But, but in meanwhile, he returned fire, and he actually uh, got the bad guy. And uh, when you see that in real life, and the policeman then retreated, and he's down, and he's, he's hit the leg, shot in the leg. And you see what it really looks like in real life, and you think, <laughs> that ain't the way it works on TV. I mean, when you get shot in the leg, you go and fight like 12 other guys, you know. It's like... Bruce Wilson died on it. I mean, you got, you're walking on glass shards and then you're fighting everybody in the building. And that, that's Hollywood. I mean, our, our lives, a lot of times, uh, it, it don't, it's not near as exciting as TV. I saw a couple of years ago the, uh, that Elon Musk, he put up the space, one of his first space uh, uh, shuttles that he sent up into space. We watched that with the boys. It was summertime. We watched that with the boys on TV. And we've been watching like... Uh, these Marvel movies, Iron Man. And when you see Iron Man, and then you see a real shuttle go into hell, you talk about a disappointment. I mean, man, that is lame. Real life sometimes. We think of courage, we think of being courageous, think of TV, excitement. Uh, we think of our own lives. Sometimes if life were a swimming pool, we just like to stay in shallow end. I mean, I, you know, I like to play it safe. I like to know that uh, I'm going to make it home safe. I'm going to be all right. The kids are going to be healthy. You know? I just do not take any high-speed chases. What about you? But still, in this crazy world we live in, as safe as we want to play it, we still got to be people of courage. And that's exactly what God says to Joshua here in Joshua chapter 1. Now, this passage, verses 6 through 9, the Bible says this. Now, this is God's message to Joshua. As he's about to take over leading the people of Israel. Now God says, verse 6, Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I, will swore, I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we continue praising you here today, thanking you for every gift, good and perfect. As we read these, uh, read these words that you instructed Joshua to be strong and courageous three different times in these four verses. Now, Lord, help us to put our faith in you. In this world where we are many times frightened and afraid and fearful, and none of us knows what tomorrow will bring, what this day will bring. If tomorrow will ever come for any of us, we don't know it. Give us uh, strength and understanding. Help us to be people of courage. Uh, just like Joshua, buying through and in, putting our faith entirely and exclusively in you, the King of glory. We pray you're glorified here in the preaching of your word, the presentation of your word. We pray that you grow your church as all the increase comes from you and belongs to you. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Joshua, uh, Joshua was told in these verse 6, 7, 8, and 9, Joshua chapter 1, four verses, he told three different times. Verse 6, be strong and courageous. Verse 7, be strong and very courageous. Verse 9, have I not commanded you, boy? But be strong and courageous. <clears throat> Joshua knows what being strong and courageous is all about. Joshua goes way back. We, we think of... Uh, Charlton Heston, you know, let my people go. You, you think of Moses. Moses led the people out of Egypt. Moses was a great servant of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 34 says, there's been no prophet in Israel, no prophet in Israel like Moses whom the Lord knew face to face. Moses was a great leader. 
Moses served the people. He brought them out of Egypt. He served the Lord. He brought the people out of Egypt. He led the people for 40 years in the desert. Moses lived to be 120 years old. His eyes were not weak. His strength was not gone. He was a tremendous leader. And sometimes we don't realize or think about it that Moses had a, an aid. He had an understudy. And that understudy was for 40 years when they came out of Egypt to the time Moses died for 40 years, that understudy was Joshua. We think of Moses. Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. Mount Sinai, he got the Ten Commandments. Absolutely. God wrote those Ten Commandments uh, in stone tablet with his own finger. Absolutely. But in Exodus 34, when Moses comes down from the mountain, he had a conversation with somebody who was with him. You know who it was? It starts with Joshua. It ends with son of Nun. Yeah, that, that's who it was. Joshua, son of Nun. That was his daddy's name, Nun. Joshua was there. Joshua was with Moses. Joshua had, had traveled with Moses, experienced what Moses would go into the tabernacle. Joshua many times was there with Moses. Joshua had quite a history here. Joshua now has taken over. Moses is dead. Talk about more, um, talk more about that later, I hope. But Joshua's commanded, man, it's your turn to be strong and courageous. And Joshua's story, not just studying as an uh, aid to Moses, Joshua was also, he was also in Numbers 13, the book of Numbers, chapter 13, he was also one of the spies who went in the promised land. You see, Moses, when they come out of Egypt, the children are led out of Egypt by Moses, and they first, it's only, it's only about 185 miles from Egypt to the promised land. It's not that far. Uh, you should be able to travel it in a month. It was 600,000 men walking like they were. A month, say, say two months. You can make it. How long does it take? <clears throat> 40 years. Why? Because the people lacked faith. See, they come out of Egypt, and they're there in the promised land. Moses, or they're heading to the promised land. Moses sends 12 spies, one from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. They go over to spy out the land. And in Numbers 13, uh, 10 men, 10 out of 12 bring back this report. Numbers 13, the Bible says, uh, this is what they said. They said, we can't attack those people. We're stronger than we are. The land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw there are of great size. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. Now, the truth of it is, the promised land was described as being a land of milk and honey. There were, there were plenty of people there, one. There were fortified cities there, two. And there were some giant people there, number three. The giant people in the Bible are called the Nephilim, are also known as the Anakites. You've probably heard of at least one descendant of an Anakite and a Nephilim. He lived in a, a Philistine town called Gath. And that dude right there was over nine feet tall. What's his name? Anybody remember? Dick, you remember? What's his name? Goliath. He was a big ugly dude. Goliath. <clears throat> but they were, they were really big and strong and powerful people. There were giants living in the promised land. And the ten men out of twelve, ten men who come back, they see the promised land, they see the big wall, the fortified city, the giants there. They say, we can't do it. They're stronger than we are. The land devours those living in it. They're all great size. We're, we're just like grasshoppers. I, that was an exaggeration. To be like a grasshopper is like this tall. Uh, and then, you know, average human being like, what, 5'8", five, 5'9", five, average man, something like that, maybe a little taller these days. It's for sure an exaggeration, but it's clear. We can't do it because they're too big. Moreover, Joshua was, now Joshua, you know, from Numbers 13, Joshua was one of the two good spies, Joshua and Caleb. They came back and they said, yeah, we, can, we can't do it, but with God's help, we can. And the footnote basically says right there, boom, chocolate. Yeah. However, however, think about this. Joshua saw those walls. Joshua saw those giants. Joshua knows what he's up against. That land is spacious. It's huge. And even with a big army like he had, it's going to take all the strength they got in some. 
Joshua knows what he's up against. And now his, his leader, Moses, is dead. And Joshua's got his hands full. And God says three times here, be strong, be courageous. Moreover, first city they come to, first city they come to in the promised land is Jericho. And Jericho was a city with a, a two walls. I understand that that was a pretty common in that day. But the outer wall, the exterior wall was, uh, I believe, six feet thick in places. The outer wall, the exterior wall, in places six feet thick. The inner wall, you had to get through the outer wall to get into the inner wall, but it was in places up to 12 feet thick. That's a big wall. It's a fortified city with huge walls. And Joshua comes first to this city. It's where God led them. And God says here in Joshua chapter 6, verse 2, uh, God said to Joshua, I have delivered. And you might remember from grammar way back in school 100 years ago. Have, uh, I have delivered. That, that's past tense. Now they haven't done it yet, but God says I have already done it. You see how that works. I have delivered Jericho into your hands. That's what God said. A fortified city, 18 feet of wall there. And Joshua was told, I have delivered. God said, I have delivered into your hands. But God has the most unusual, you might remember. God has the most unusual battle plan that maybe ever was. And it's highlighted here in Joshua 6. It says, uh, uh, after all, Hebrews 11 verse 1, Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. When God says it's done, it's a done deal. Amen. And the battle plan in Joshua 6 is this. God says to Joshua, this is what I want you to do. Here's the plan. March. March around the city once with all our men. Do this for six days and have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear the sound of one blast on the trumpets, have the people give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up. Every man straight in. <laughs> and you've got to be thinking, Lord, are you serious about this one? <laughs> you remember Cousin Eddie in the National Lampoon uh, movie? And he said, are you serious, Clark? Are you serious? <laughs> you got to find Joshua saying, Lord, <laughs> are you serious about this one? you got a fortified city here, uh, 18 feet, a wall here. You want us to march around here? March around the city and blow trumpets? Lord, are you trying to start a marching band here? That's what you got in mind. Lord, let me ask you, you got anybody inside the city? He said, yeah, I, I got a prostitute in there, but she's on your side. <laughs> what? This is God's plan. And, and God's plans are perfect. Because the truth of the matter is, as the Bible teaches us, King David says it later on when he fights that giant, Goliath. In 1 Samuel 17, this is what King David said in verse 47. David says to Goliath, just before he kills that guy, he says this, he says, All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. Pop quiz. Who does the battle belong to? The battle belongs to the Lord. And when God says to march around the city and blow trumpets, that means all you've got to do is march around the city and blow trumpets. Because God said, the battle, the battle belongs to the Lord. No matter what wall it is that you're facing, no matter what adversary stands in front of you, the battle belongs to the Lord. You see, my courage, courage is not fear, is not the absence of fear. Now sometimes we try to avoid stuff. I mean, if you don't want to go to the party alone, so you just don't, you just don't go. You're afraid. You're related, a relationship you're not so sure about, so you avoid that person. You got financial hardship, and so when the bills come in the mail, just don't open the mail. Maybe that'll make your problems go away. Doesn't work that way. A child needs discipline, but it's easier just to turn up the TV, just act like it's not happening. See how that works for you. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is doing what God has called you to do, even though you are afraid. You see, yeah. Uh, it's a paradigm shift. 
uh, a paradigm shift from not how big the wall is, how big the problem is, instead it's how big God is. And that's what Joshua, that's the step that Joshua's made, that's what really this story's all about. Joshua's not looking at this fortified city alone. He's not looking at this wall, two, two walls, exterior and interior, 18 feet total. Joshua's not just looking at the walls, he's not looking at the city, he's looking beyond that, looking how big God is. And man, that would behoove us to do the same. The Bible says, in the book of Isaiah, the Bible says, uh, Isaiah the prophet writes, says, who has measured who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? You know what that is? That's, that's in the hollow of your hand. That's right there. The Bible says that God has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. Do you know water takes up like 70% of the space of all the earth? There's seven oceans around the world, and it's just one big pond out there. Man, it's, <clears throat> that's a lot of water. And the Bible says of all the gallons, gazillion, trezillion gallons of water in that ocean, the Bible says that God measured it in the hollow of his hand. <clears throat> he must wear a big glove, you know what I mean? The Bible says he's mocked it off, he measured water in the hollow of his hand, but the breadth of his hand he mocked off the heavens. The breadth of your hand here, but even most people from like the tip of your uh, pinky, pick your, tip of your thumbs, like nine inches. The universe, they say, I haven't measured this myself. They say the universe to the closest star from planet Earth, the closest star is a 4.5 light years away. That's 6, 26 trillion miles. And the Bible says that uh, with the breath of his hand, he's marked off the heavens. And the Bible's telling us, man, he's big. He's bigger than all our problems. He's bigger than the walls we're facing. If we just don't focus on what's just immediately preceding, we focus instead on what's beyond, what's overpowering, is God Almighty. See, God's power. And when God says, and he can't lie, it's who he is, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 2, the Bible says it is impossible. It says God cannot lie. Hebrews 6 says it is impossible for God to lie. And when God says it, that's the way it's going to be because he's the creator of all things. After all, you remember in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5 says, By God's Word the heavens existed, and the earth was formed. The Word of God. The Word of God brings faith. Faith comes by hearing Romans 10, verse 17, comes by hearing the Word of God. Jesus said, this, this uh, carpenter turned preacher from the hometown of Nazareth, which nobody ever heard of, which wasn't even mentioned in the Old Testament, Jesus comes traveling and preaching, and this bold carpenter turned preacher said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And here we are now, some 2,000 years since he died and allegedly rose back to life, and we still have his word. And we can pick up and read. Maybe, maybe there's something to what he said, you know. It's the word of God. The word that will never return void. The word that's powerful. When God says it, it's the way it is because he's that big and he's in control and he's Lord of all. You see, uh, it takes courage. It takes courage to serve God and have this paradigm shift. Instead of looking at your problems, you look at the greatness of God. The Bible teaches us, uh, the Bible teaches us that if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. It's possible because what God does, who God is, we're made brand new. And as surely as the Bible says that in 2 Corinthians 5.17, it's the word of God. It's just as powerful and effective as it was in Joshua chapter 6. When God told Joshua, march around the city, the people need only to obey God's word. In Joshua chapter 6, there, verse 20 says this, says, uh, on the seventh day, after they marched around the city seven times, blowing the trumpets, the Bible says um, the wall of that city, Jericho, the wall collapsed, and every man charged straight in, and they took the city. God's words are true. And God is calling us to serve Him, to know His goodness, to serve Him faithfully. <clears throat> Truth of the matter is that Christians, Christians are serving in an army that most people don't have the guts to join. You see, we're part of God's guard, God's army. Soldiers of the cross. And we are called to serve Him. 
to live with this faith like Joshua exhibited, like all the saints in the Old Testament exhibited. We're called to focus on God's greatness. Because he's that great. He's worth following. His words are true. He's faithful. We're called to be people of courage. You know, on Father's Day, you struggle with what to preach. And I struggle bad on this this week. What do you say? And, and I even look through, uh, you look through the Old Testament, and, and you see uh, kings, the kings of Israel that followed David. Some were good, some were bad. Some of the worst kings had good sons. Some of the best kings had bad sons. And there's no real correlation between doing good yourself and having your son to do good after you. You'd be good. <clears throat> you really don't know. Then the verse that I'm using in the communion meditation, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2 says this. says, uh, God said, I reared up children, they rebelled against me. And as perfect as we try to be as fathers, <laughs> if God raised up children, and he is perfect, and still his children rebelled against him, then what does that say for us? So... <laughs> You're good, but your kids turn out bad. You're bad, your kids turn out good. It don't really matter. There's no correlation. Here's what we do. We decide today to pick up our cross and follow Jesus, to live boldly, to live with courage, because it's always the right thing to do the right thing. And what God's called us to do, first and foremost, most important, is love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. We don't know. We don't know the free will of our children or somebody else. We don't know what somebody else is going to do when we're dating them. We don't know. But we know that today we're going to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. We know God's called us through Jesus Christ, His sacrifice at Calvary, His blood. He's called us to the forgiveness of sins. He's called us to new life, and by His power, the operation of faith, we are born again. Is this thing on? It's on. Woo! Because of what God can do, what God is doing, we're made brand new. We need only focus on His goodness. Put our trust in Him today. What God is doing, has done, is doing, will do until our Lord comes. You see, the Bible teaches it's a victorious story. For all those who trust and obey, Christ paid for sin, paid for it in full, and those who are washed in His blood, born again, Repenting of sins, confessing Christ His Lordship, all in faith in Him. You can be born again, sin washed away, and raised to walk in new life. And for those of us in Christ, it's, it's not an absence of fear. We're very much afraid. Man, there's stuff in this world to be afraid of. Courage is, is doing what God said to do, even when you are afraid. And that's our plot. See, the Bible calls us this victorious story. I don't know. Ephesians 1, verse 7, in Christ you have the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1, verse number, uh, that was verse 7, verse number 4 says, uh, in Christ you're holy and blameless in his sight. John chapter 3, verse 36 says this, the Son, the Son of God set you free. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3 says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Philippians 4, verse 13 says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. 1 John 4, verse 4 says, The one who is in you, Christian, is greater than he who is in the world. Psalm 23, verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow you, Christian, all the days of your life. You will dwell in the Lord's house forever. Amen. It's a victorious story. Christ overcame. He's Lord of all. And by the grace of God, the word he is. It makes all the difference. They're, the battles to fight, the walls are big. What do we do? Well, that's a decision that you and I have to make every day. Are you and I going to take up our cross to follow Him? Is we or ain't? What are we going to do? You see, uh, the truth of this story, the fact of the matter in Joshua chapter 1, it starts out in verse 1. The Bible says this. It says, uh, um, it says, after the death of Moses, notice Joshua 1, verse 1 and 2. After the death of Moses, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is a, Moses, my servant, is dead. It was the death of Moses, that faithful servant, the faithful man of God from the burning bush, leading the people out of Egypt, Ten Commandments, Moses, 40 years in the desert, his leadership is over. It was the death of Moses that catapulted Joshua to leadership. And death really is probably a great example. 
Because we all know the finality of death. The pain, the separation, the certainty. And sometimes it's the death of somebody that catapults somebody else into leadership, into service. It's the gospel preacher, minister 50 years, he's not here to do it anymore. Who's going to step up? It's the guy that met you at the church door for decades with every service with a smile on his face. He's gone. Who's going to do it now? It's the woman who taught Sunday school through a dozen different presidents. It's the deacon who got to church every early, uh, early every week. He got to build every week so he could turn the thermostat up or down, as the case may be required. It's the elder who taught, uh, story, told stories of teaching a Bible study by candlelight. It's the grandparent who taught you how to pray. It's the uncle who lost his battle with cancer but won the Christian race. Sometimes it is death that catapults you into service, but it's not always death. Maybe it's the scan that reveals a lump. It's the husband and wife who are just too tired of fighting. They're going to do things different. It's the employee whose boss just handed him a pink slip. It's the father who had to explain to his little girl why he couldn't be faithful to her mother. It's the mother who breaks down and comes to terms with her drinking problem. It's the parent of a child born with a disability. And it's somebody seeking truth and comfort and hope and can find it only in the place it can be found is in the one who walked out of his own tomb. Amen. It's only found in Christ. It's death and it's everything else. For those who are seeking, for those who search, but God is still, he's still faithful. He's still on the throne. He's still in charge, still in control. And he's still calling. Whosoever we, let him come. We're called to be a people, Kurt. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 6, 7, 8, 9, three times God said to Joshua, be strong, be courageous. I love verse 8. I saw I was in the line at the gas station this week. Some guy in front of me had a hat on. said, Joshua 1, 8, I'm back up. I know what it says. Meditate on the law of the Lord, and if you're careful to do everything written in it, you will be prosperous and successful. That's what I want to be. What about you? Joshua 1, 6 through 9 is powerful. But verse 9 says, Joshua, be strong, be courageous. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. And we say, man, Joshua was brave. I mean, he was brave. I mean, he marched around the walls of Jericho. I mean, he went to the promised land. I mean, he was brave. But, but wouldn't you be brave if that's what God said to you? I'll be with you. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. Wouldn't that make you brave? You better believe it. You see, uh, that, that's what the Bible says. But don't take my word. Never, never take my word for it because the preacher could be wrong. But the word of God is always right. And I can say uh, and show you here, this is what God has said because the Bible says in Hebrews 13, Hebrews 13, verse 5 and 6, God has said to you, to every Christian, and will ever be, God has said this, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. God's called us to be a people of courage. As the praise team comes up. And God wants what's best for us. There's all kinds of rules in that Old Testament, but it just summed up in this, in this capacity. God wants what's best for you. He's not trying to keep you from having a good time. He, he knows what's best. He sees how the story ends. And he loves you too much to leave you in your disobedience. Today is the day of salvation. New life is real, possible, through obedience to the Word of God. As we all stand and sing our invitation him. If you have a decision to accept Christ, no way the gospel, a decision to rededicate your life to him, any decision as we sing today, won't you come and be here for us?